Welcome to our podcast series and in this podcast we're going to be focusing on system technologies. This will involve a discussion about questions related to hardware and software in computing. These topics are from question 2 of the 2003 Information Technology or IT November exam and there are three ways I suggest that you can engage with the content from this podcast. Option number one is if you want to test your knowledge, then first download the questions covered in the video. There is a link to a PDF in the video description below. Then I would attempt the questions in that document and then come back and listen to the discussed answers and then compare them with your answers. Another way to engage in the content is to use option two. If you want to use the podcast to learn new information, then listen to the discussion first, then download the questions from the document that we mentioned earlier, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. And then our third option is to simply enjoy the discussion by listening to it and learning more about systems technologies. And now let's hear what our podcasts have to say on systems technologies. Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, really getting into the nuts and bolts of computers, hardware, software, the essentials. Yeah, the kind of stuff that makes everything tick. Exactly. We're sort of framing this around the idea of, say, putting new computers in an administration building. That scenario brings up some really fundamental questions. It really does. Because choosing new machines, it's not just about the logo on the box, is it? There's so much going on inside. Mm -hmm. So we'll dig into those internal parts, storage options, uh, the whole cloud thing, and keep it all safe and running well. Super important stuff. Crucial, yeah. Whether you're just starting out or you know want to understand things a bit deeper. Right. Okay, so let's dive in. The motherboard. It's like the foundation, right? Mm. If you're buying desktops, what makes one different? Why should uh, students care about these details? Oh, it's central. Literally, it connects everything. So first up, you'll hear about the ZIF socket type. ZIF socket. Sounds technical. It is, but basically it's just the holder for the CPU, the brain. And crucially, the socket type must match the CPU you want to use. They won't work together otherwise. Okay, so compatibility check number one. Got it. And the board also dictates the kind of CPU and its bus speed. What's bus speed telling us? Yeah, exactly. Bus speed is, well, it's how fast data moves between the CPU and other bits on the motherboard. Faster bus speed usually means, you know, a snappier system overall. Right. Makes sense. And the chipset, what's its job? Ah, the chipset. Think of it as the motherboard's traffic director. It manages communication between the CPU, the memory, the RAM, and all those expansion slots. It really defines what the board can do and how well it does it. So it's key for performance and features. Mm. And those expansion slots, like PCIe slots, that's for adding extras later. Precisely. For things like a better graphics card, if you get into gaming or video editing, or maybe a dedicated sound card, the number and type of slots give you flexibility for the future. Future-proofing, yeah. Important for an organization, maybe. What about the ports on the back? USB, audio? Seems straightforward. Mostly, yeah, but you got to look at the types. Like USB 3.0 or USB-C are much faster than the older ones. Makes a big difference if you move large files around. Oh, good point. And the number of ports, too, I guess. Definitely. And then there's RAM, the computer's short-term memory. The motherboard has slots for that, DIMM slots. Mm -hmm. Does it limit how much RAM you can have? Yes, it does. The specs tell you that the number of slots the type of RAM it needs, like DDR4, the newer DDR5, and the absolute maximum amount it supports. So more RAM slots, potentially more multitasking power. Generally, yeah. More RAM lets you juggle more apps without slowdown. Important for an admin setting, probably. Okay. And some boards have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth built in. Is that just convenience? It's convenient, sure, but it also frees up USB ports or expansion slots you might otherwise need for adapters. Sometimes it's just cleaner, performs better, too. Right. And SATA ports, that's for storage drives. Yep. SATA is the standard for connecting your internal hard drives, or more likely these days, SSDs, solid-state drives. The number of ports limits how many internal drives you can install. Okay. And form factor, that's just the physical size. Exactly. ATX, micro-ATX, mini-ITX. It dictates the size the case it fits in. So space constraints might matter. Makes sense. And lastly, onboard NIC. Network interface card. Lets you plug in an Ethernet cable for network access. Pretty much always built in now because, well, everyone needs network connectivity. Okay, wow. So choosing a motherboard? Yeah. It's not simple. It's about balancing current needs, future expansion, and making sure everything plays nicely together. You got it. 
It's the foundation. Get it right and you're set up well. Okay. So the CPU is the main brain. Yeah. But what else processes data? You mentioned the GPU. Yeah, the graphics processing unit, sometimes called a graphics card or video card. Right. And what does that handle? Just games. Not just games, no. It's specialized for visual stuff, rendering images, videos, animations, even just making your desktop look smooth. It takes that load off the main CPU. Ah, I see. So even for design software or just high-res displays in the admin building, a decent GPU helps. Absolutely. It makes things run smoother visually and frees up the CPU for other tasks. Better overall performance, really. Okay, cool. Let's switch to storage. Secondary storage capacity is obviously important. Our source mentions flash storage, flash drives, SSDs, memory cards. What's the big deal with flash? Speed and durability, basically. Flash storage, like in an SSD, uses chips, not moving parts like old hard drives. Ah, uh, no spinning disks. Right. So accessing data is way faster. Think boot times, opening apps, almost instant with an SSD. Plus, no moving parts means they're tougher, less likely to break if bumped. And more energy efficient, too, probably. Yeah, that too. So for those new admin computers, SSDs would make a huge difference in perceived speed. And things like USB flash drives or SD cards are just handy portable versions. Okay, now, cloud-based virtual servers. The IT folks are looking into this. What exactly is that? Okay, so instead of a physical server box sitting in a room in the building. Right, humming away, needing cooling. Exactly. A cloud-based virtual server is basically software running on powerful hardware in some company's giant data center somewhere else. You connect to it over the internet. So you're renting server power online, essentially. Pretty much. Okay, why would they do that? What are the upsides? Well, a big one is accessibility. If it's online, authorized people can get to it from anywhere with internet. Great for remote work, stuff like that. Makes sense. What else? Scalability is huge. Need more power or storage, you can usually scale it up quickly in the cloud. Need less, scale it down. Hmm. You're not stuck with physical hardware you bought. Ah, uh, flexible. Yeah. Unlike buying a big server that might be overkill half the time. Exactly. And the cloud provider handles the hardware, maintenance, the cooling, the power, often the base security and updates for the infrastructure. So less work for the local IT team. Mm -hmm. And potentially better reliability because these providers have backups and redundancies. It can even be cheaper sometimes once you factor everything in. Outsourcing the hassle, basically. Okay. And related to that, SaaS software as a service. We know it's like renting software, but well, what else? Well, a big plus is usually no installation needed on each computer. You often just use it through a web browser. Makes setup way easier. Ah, and updates too. The provider handles those. Yep, the SAWS company pushes updates automatically. No need for IT to update every single machine. It saves a ton of time. Totally. And often the computers themselves don't need to be super powerful because the hard work is done on the provider servers. Could save on hardware costs. Interesting. And data storage. The provider handles that too, usually including backups. That's a big weight off the admin's shoulders. Yeah, data safety baked in. Plus, like cloud servers, you can usually access SaaS apps from anywhere on different devices, often good collaboration features too. And it scales easily pay for the users you need. Sounds like cloud and SaaS offer a lot of flexibility then. Yeah. Okay, let's talk licensing. Site licenses versus single user licenses. Why go for a site license if you have lots of users? It's mainly about simplicity and cost. A site license lets everyone in the organization, or maybe just that building, use the software under one agreement. Instead of juggling hundreds of individual keys. Exactly. Much less administrative hassle. And it's usually cheaper per user than buying individual licenses for everyone. Just more efficient for an organization. Makes sense. Okay, protecting all this data, backup strategies, what is that simply? And how does it prevent downtime? A backup strategy is just your plan for making regular copies of important data and storing them somewhere safe, separate from the originals. Like a spare key for your data. Perfect analogy. If the original data gets lost, hardware failure, ransomware attack, accidental deletion, whatever, you use the backup copy to restore it. Ah, so you can get back up and running quickly. That's the key. It minimizes downtime. Instead of days trying to recover or recreate lost work, you restore from the backup, maybe losing only a little bit of recent data, and get going again much faster. It's a safety net. Mm. Essential. Now, using cloud storage for those backups sounds convenient for off-site storage, but any downsides? There are a few things, yeah. First, you absolutely need internet access, both to send the backups up and, crucially, to get them back down if you need to restore. No internet, no restore. 
Okay, reliance on connectivity. Right. And backing up huge amounts of data can take ages and use a lot of bandwidth. Same for restoring downloading terabytes can take a long time. Potential bottleneck then. Could be. Then there's cost. Cloud storage isn't always free, especially for large amounts. And security. You're trusting a third party with your data. Reckonable providers are secure, but it's still a consideration. A calculated risk, maybe? Kind of. And though unlikely, there's always the tiny risk the provider could go out of business or have a major failure themselves. Hmm. So cloud backups are good for offsite, but maybe not the only backup. Exactly. Best practice is usually a mix, maybe local backups for speed, cloud backups for disaster recovery, the 3 2 one rule, that kind of thing. A layered approach. Got it. The study guide asks, what type of computer user someone taking a course like engineering graphics and design would be considered? Oh, they'd definitely be a power user. Someone who needs a computer that can handle really demanding tasks like 3D modeling, rendering, simulations, all that. Okay, security threats, computer worms. What are they? What makes them nasty? Worms are a type of malware, but their defining feature is they can copy themselves and spread automatically across networks. Without you clicking anything? Often, yes. They exploit vulnerabilities in software or the OS to jump from computer to computer. Some can even email themselves to your contacts. Whoa, so they can spread really fast through an organization. Potentially, yeah. And they can cause problems. Some create backdoors for other malware. They consume resources, slowing down computers and networks. Some might even delete or damage files. The resource hog, network clogger, potential data destroyer, and self-spreading. Nasty. Yep. So how do we stop them? Why is antivirus better than just a firewall? I thought firewalls were the guards. Firewalls are vital guards, but they mostly guard the entrances controlling network traffic coming in and going out. They check addresses and ports, but don't usually inspect the content deeply for malware, especially if it's sneaking through an allowed connection. Ah, so the firewall controls who gets to the door, but not necessarily if they're carrying something bad. That's a decent way to put it. Antivirus software, though, is specifically designed to detect and remove malware like worms. It scans files, watches system behavior, looks for known malware signatures or suspicious activity. So it finds the bad stuff that might get past the firewall or that spreads internally. Exactly. Antivirus is looking for the malware itself. You really need both a firewall to limit access and antivirus to catch anything malicious that gets through or originates inside. Layered security again. Makes total sense. Okay. One last thing, defragmentation. The source says the new computers will have SSDs and they don't need defragging. Why not? I remember doing that on older PCs. Yeah, it used to be a thing. Yeah. Okay, so old hard disk drives, HDDs, had spinning platters and a physical arm, a read-write head that moved to find data. Right, like a tiny record player. Kind of, and vials would get split up, fragmented all over the platter. Defragging put the pieces of each file back together physically so the arm didn't have to jump around so much, making access faster. Okay, I remember it taking ages. So why don't SSDs need it? Because SSDs have no moving parts. They use flash memory chips. The controller chip knows where every bit of data is, and it can access any part of the drive almost instantly, electronically. Doesn't matter if a file's pieces are physically scattered. Ah, so the physical location doesn't affect speed like it did with the moving arm. Exactly. Access time is pretty much uniform across the drive. So, defragging an SSD offers zero speed benefit. In fact, because SSDs have a limited number of writes to each memory cell, defragging just causes unnecessary wear and can actually shorten the drive's lifespan. So it's pointless and potentially harmful for SSDs? Good to know. Don't defrag your SSD. Definitely not. It's tech from a previous era. Wow, okay. We've covered a lot today from motherboards, deep dives, storage, cloud stuff, sauce, security like worms and backups, really core concepts for anyone in computer studies. Absolutely. Seeing how these pieces fit together, the hardware choices, the software models like SAWS, the security implications, the right maintenance, it builds that foundational understanding. So thinking about all these interconnected parts, hardware, software, cloud security, maintenance, what do you think is the most critical takeaway for someone learning about computer systems today? What's the one thing they really need to grasp? That's a great question, I think. I think it's realizing just how interconnected it all is. You can't really look at hardware without thinking about the software it needs to run effectively or security without considering backup and recovery. Choosing a cloud service impacts your network needs and your data management strategy. It's understanding those dependencies, those relationships between all the parts. That's really key to managing systems well.
seeing the whole picture, not just the individual components, definitely something to chew on. We really hope this deep dive has sparked some curiosity and encourage everyone listening to keep exploring these fascinating topics. Thanks for joining us. It would really help us if you give us some feedback on these podcasts. Are they helping you? If so, leave a comment, leave a like. Please make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that we can keep making more of these resources for you. And remember, don't do it the long way. Do it the Mr. Long Way.